morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know it's kind of an early time to start talking about money and finance and everything. So um, I'm going to be going, oh, you know what, I bet, I bet this is on a timer. So this may just kind of scroll, and I might have to come back to it. This is from our association. But basically what I want to talk to you today about is um, a, a little bit of some understanding on tools that you can use for when people come in and ask about just sort of anything when it comes to financial planning. Um, one of the things I love about financial planning is that there's really no one right way to do it. It's a holistic thing that encompasses sort of every bit of your lives. And that can include um, everything from you know your retirement assets to education to just figuring out a way to make sure that you're actually you know saving some money every month. Um, so, unfortunately, I, I think this is going to kind of just scroll through. So I'm going to use my presentation to just kind of start. And then if, uh, if you have any questions throughout, please just go ahead and throw up a hand. Um, I'd like this to be interactive if you guys want that. And if not, then I can sit up here and just chat at you the whole time. Too, so. Um, so first and foremost, reasons people seek financial planning. Um, I think that overall, uh, it's it's almost too easy to say that it's just for retirement planning, that it's just for education planning. Um, it's really when something happens in your life. And, and I think that whether or not you've gone through a financial planning process yourself or you've thought about it, typically the reason that people go and seek out a financial planner or, or seek out financial advice in general is because some life event has happened. And now that can be sort of anything. There, there are certainly some ones that sort of resonate more than others. Um, top of mind, you know, divorce, death of a family member, um, inheritance, uh, kids growing to a certain age, and, and education planning becomes sort of forefront in your mind. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why people will seek it out. I think that another one that, that probably isn't quite so often thought about is change in job, whether that's you you've left your job or you've gotten a promotion. Um, these are all times when it's a really good idea to, to start thinking about sort of a change in the way you've gone about your planning personally, and certainly as people um, will come to you and ask about these things, these life events are sort of the triggers that have people think about them in their minds. Um, now, as far as pro bono planning goes, uh, I would say pro bono planning sticks to the basics. So whenever you start talking about someone that's already got a, a number of retirement assets or they've got a big college savings plan, most of those people have already put run planning, even if they don't really think of it that way. Um, these, these folks have already kind of put it in their mind that they want something to happen and they've begun making a habit to get themselves to that point. Um, those are ideal uh, in the sense that <clears throat> folks that have already begun to do that process in their head, the idea that the plan is needed, are much easier to coach and then also just talk to you about, um, uh, about what's next on their journey. The harder ones are the, the ones that haven't done anything. They don't have anything outside of a checking and savings account. They want to know sort of, you know, when can I retire? What is it that I need to do to get to the point where you know I'm not worried about finance? I, I heard uh, Alice bring up the whole idea of, uh, or someone in the audience, uh, the paycheck to paycheck mentality. Um, and the truth is, I think that most of us start out on that paycheck to paycheck mentality. I certainly know for myself. I graduated from college in 2011, um, and you know, student loan debt is a big deal because, and it's not something that's easily pushed aside. Um, and so certainly as you're, as you're younger, especially nowadays, um, but even as you get older, whether it's credit card debt that's added up because you haven't had an ability to pay for it with cash or uh, you really haven't done anything because you've been so focused on debt reduction, um, there's a million different iterations and, and certainly what I'm going to do today is, is kind of go through a bunch of these tools um, that are helpful and certainly I would say the, the easiest way to articulate a financial planning process is to have gone through one yourself. And whether that's something that you've done for yourself or you've gone and met with someone, um, that's really the easiest way to then turn around and do it for someone else. So 
this is going to go through a, a few different things, but I'll kind of begin with. Let me go back to it. This is so the way that financial planning works overall is you have to start with a goal. Much like you know your education itself, you can't just say I want a degree. It's not that easy, right? You, you could go and take a million different classes and nothing really comes to fruition because you've just sort of done it in a, a big spread. So, um, let me come back to that real quick. So on this, uh, on this goal sheet, basically what it's showing, the, and all of these resources that are gonna be up here are in the back, and I've also emailed them to Daniel, so if anybody wants them, um, they come in both electronic and paper form. But, um, Basically what you're doing is you're creating sort of what your target is for the next 10 years. And 10 years can be a little bit uh, intimidating. So what I like to do is I like to start with the near term. So maybe it's a vacation planning. Maybe it's, uh, you know, you, you want to do something with your savings. So it's a purchase. You want to buy a car. These are all much nearer term things that don't necessarily have that big time horizon that's so scary. Um, but it begins with your goals. And so if someone comes in and they're, they're hoping to accomplish something, more often than not, um, they will have already thought about goals in their mind without maybe articulating that to themselves. So that's, that's an important sheet. And what I'd say uh, as far as that goes, um, some of the ones that I've seen most commonly, um, you've got retirement savings, college savings, tax planning, um, and then also debt repayment. Debt repayment is a big one nowadays, particularly, like I said, with the student loans. Um, but it also, you know, it also comes down to consumer credit as well. Okay, so that leads me to the next thing, which I'll bring up again. A creation of <laughs> What did I do? Here you go. Okay, so the creation of an honest budget. And I say honest budget because all too often I think folks will go through and say, I'm going to spend, you know, whatever it happens to be in the city nowadays. Like I, I last I heard was like 1700 for rent. But, you know, they'll put something in there that doesn't necessarily correspond to what actually occurs. And where people are worse about this is monthly spending on just consumer goods, whether that's restaurants and eating out, whether that's, uh, you know, clothes, whether that's they go out to a lot of, events, people tend to uh, undersell themselves for the amount they're actually spending. So honest budget, that's a big deal. And there's a couple of different resources here that you can use to, uh, to sort of begin that honest budget. But the easiest way to do it is to actually pull the statements and start highlighting, start saying, okay, here's where we spent money on restaurants. Here's where we went out and bought a bunch of clothes. Here's where we did this. Um, and that really, you add all those up and you come to a conclusion of what you're spending on a monthly basis. Typically what I like to do with clients when they're first starting this process is go back three or six months. Um, that's gonna be your best window into what the actual mentality is right now. Um, and then use that to project forward, um, and I'll show some other resources as we go through, uh, but project forward what the actual um, amount will be to fund these goals that you've come up with. <clears throat> okay, this is perfect. So one of the things we like to grab as financial planners is all of this personal information. One of the reasons, one of the reasons is um, when you come and you grab all of this stuff here, this really gives you a snapshot into what someone has. Now, not everybody has all of this stuff. Um, Sorry about that, that constant change here. Um, but it really puts into one, one independent document all of the resources that you have to fund these goals. Now, um, if someone doesn't have anything, that's a really good indication too. You've got this blank sheet of paper, and so you get to create that plan. The other thing that I would say is, while most people don't necessarily think of this as financial planning, a couple of things that were on there that you'll see at the bottom are whether or not you have a will created whether or not you have uh, powers of attorney created. That's something I see all the time in my practice that folks just disregard what's gonna happen in the future and all too often, whether it's uh, an accident or whether it's an untimely death, uh, you don't actually get to 
project onto the next generation or your family members what it is that your true legacy is um, because it just flows by law rather than flowing how you want it to. So that's a big one. It's really simple to create a will. It's, it's not necessarily cheap, um, but it is one of those things that if you want your assets to go to someone in particular, or if you don't want your debts to go to someone in particular, that's, a, that's something that's a really big component. And then the other thing that I would say um, on that personal information sheet is the time horizon. So that has to do with how old you are, sort of what you're making, how long your goals are, because someone who's, let's just say, 45, really has a less than 20 year time horizon until they're probably you know, retirement age. Whereas someone who's just coming out of school has this 30 year timeline, and it's so hard to predict 30 years down the road that you're just not gonna plan that far. One of the things I love about financial planning is that there's this constant refinement. So you come in and you, you put together a plan, and the truth is, the moment that plan's done, it's out of date because tomorrow something might change. Um, and so the, the truth of the matter is that the best financial planning actually is this continual refinement, this continual check-in. Is that still a goal of yours? Did you really want to own that you know, uh, second house down the road? It might not be such an ideal thing if you come down to the conclusion that I want to do other things above this. So that time horizon is really huge. Uh, in the sake of, depending on your age, depending on the number, or excuse me, the uh, amount of time for the goals that you want to have, uh, that, that really plays a factor in how you go about the savings process. So as we kind of go through some more, um, it'll come up here in just a second. There's a balance sheet. Um, balance sheet's pretty easy. Just kind of captures the liabilities and, and assets that you kind of uh, currently have. <clears throat> and then the next slide after that, it's coming up here in just a sec, so I'll, I'll pause real briefly. So this is that balance sheet I, had, I had discussed. So this is a debt management plan. And certainly, I know for, for younger individuals, but for everybody, um, if you do have debt, the best way to get out of it is to plan for it. Um, now that can be something as simple as saying, I'm gonna pay an extra $5 towards principal over the, the minimum payment. Maybe that's all you can afford. But it's a plan and it's something you have to stick to. Um, <clears throat> one of the hardest things about money, I think, and certainly from a, from a younger individual's perspective, is that you sort of convince yourself that there's going to be more later. And it's hard to really kind of take into um, an earnest conversation with yourself that, you know, right now is really where you're at. And, and you can project all you want, but you don't know. So, one of the things that I really coach people and, and certainly my peers to do is to look at your budget, figure out where it is that you're spending excess money, and certainly that's the, that's the idea around that honest budget, is you can say, okay, I'm spending far too much eating out. If I save $25, um, that would help me pay down this credit card faster. Um, so those are the simple little steps that can be taken to uh, start that debt management, and that debt management, <clears throat> Um, she really lets you write it out. You know, there's the student loans, I want to pay an extra this amount, and this is what my principal balance is. Uh, credit cards, this amount, and so on and so forth. <coughs> um, spending plan. This is another way, let me pull that back up real quick. This is another way that you can go through that, um, depending on, it breaks out a number of categories. All of these are pre-made sheets. But they're really just Excel spreadsheets. And so you can come in and make kind of however it is that either you feel best or uh, the folks that are talking with you, however they feel best about <clears throat> what those sort of guidelines are that they're, they're going to spend on. So once you have these spending plans and the debt management, now you can really get into your goals and look at, you know, if it's retirement that you're worried about, that's when you can start allocating extra funds that direction. Certainly there are benefits that come from doing certain kinds of retirement planning, whether it's um, tax deductions from an IRA, whether it's uh, qualified plans that come from either uh, government uh, employment or education employment or um, simply a 401k, those are, those are certainly the most popular ones. Um, but along those lines, it really starts to become easy if it's a set it and forget it sort of thing. 
Um, much like a savings account, if you just put money in there and never see it hit, you know, either your paycheck or um, your, your, if you're cashing your paycheck, if it never actually gets in your hand, it's much easier to kind of put that out of sight, out of mind. And that's the way I think of retirement planning. Certainly these days, you know, the markets, while the prices are up, the overall gain year over year, we're hitting this new normal of a low growth environment in that in that world. And so it's easier to think of it as a savings account than it is like I'm gonna get, you know, seven to ten percent on this. That just doesn't exist anymore. And so having that mentality of savings versus investing for retirement um, really helps to to just put that out of sight, out of mind. A couple other things I want to bring up on that. Um, general rule of thumb when people are talking about retirement planning, uh, if you're talking about retirement spending, typically it's about 70 or 80% of what you already spend. There are things that you just don't do once you're retired. That's save, you know, don't put money aside for savings. You're not going to put money into these um, 401ks or IRAs. Um, at that point, you're just going to be more about you know, bringing in the income. So, that's a, that's a piece to know as you're going through the retirement. Uh, I, have a, I have a Yeah, please. Um, so, we had a crash in 2008, and there's a lot of conflicting predictions about um, what might happen in the future. What, is, what are your thoughts being on that? <laughs> specifically uh, to the, the housing market, or specifically no, to... Well, no, I'm thinking more like putting, people putting money in that. Market, what kind of safety, you know, people are going to lose thousands of retirement again like they did. And here's, I'll answer that with two, two different pieces. The first one that I'll say is that people are far more worried about losing money than gaining money. I think that if you look around the room and really introspectively look, people would be much happier winning, excuse me, would be much more upset losing $100 than winning $100. It's just the, the nature of of humanity, it's the way we think. So there is this uncommon fear that comes with knowing that you've been through crashes. There's two of them that have happened in my lifetime, the, the 2000s tech bubble and then the, the mid-2000s uh, housing crisis. Personally, I would say that if you think of things as savings accounts, then you're not looking at it so much as this idea of, of making money in the market it's much easier to ride those, and if you push it out to a longer time horizon, it's gonna be upward overall. It's hard to ride the volatility um, if you're looking for, let's just use an example of like one year. One year from now, do I expect that you're gonna make a lot of money? No, could you potentially lose a lot of money? Sure, and you know, that's the hard part about investing in the markets. Uh, but what I would say is that diversification is the ultimate way to, to get around that. And that's, um, for, for generic purposes, diversification is going to be the idea that you're in a whole bunch of different asset classes, whether it's fixed income, whether it's um, you know, the, uh, the stock market itself, real estate, <coughs> all these things that sort of correspond differently when, when big crashes happen. Um, now, when the crash happened in 08, everything fell. So it, it really didn't matter where you were, some people lost money. And that's, that's the unfortunate nature of kind of trying to predict those sorts of things. I would say the more you think about things as savings versus investing, that will help ride that out. My personal opinion, and this isn't the opinion of the FBA or anything like that, my personal opinion is that as long as you're continually writing that strategic plan that you put forth for yourself, whether it's you know stashing aside 25 bucks a month uh, off of your paycheck or whether that happens to be you know putting four or five percent into your 401k or uh, uh, 403B, anything like that, down the road, that savings itself is going to compound, right? And whether that's buying into shares that then, even if they plummet, you're still buying into a number of shares that will all rise. Um, my, my view is that there's always going to be peaks and valleys, and that you have to sort of take a long-term approach to it. Um, I know that's kind of a, a generic answer, but that's, that's kind of the way I look at it. Any other questions? Yeah. I have maybe a long topic question. Sure. Well, it's a long topic. So I serve uh, people who are incarcerated, who don't have money, and have enormous amounts of debt, and they're looking for ways to 
change their mind. So they've got these previous debts, legal financial obligations, and it all just feels overwhelming. So uh, pro bono legal assistance is probably going to be too basic for them because they've got such complicated financial issues. Um, if they were to seek out some sort of uh, assistance that they paid for, what could they, where could they seek that out, and how much could they expect to pay? It's a good and question. Would that be appropriate? That's a good question. I'm not sure that I actually have the answer for that, given that that's legal advice versus sort of financial advice, um, particularly just given that that's not my realm of expertise, and, and for the sake of what they would what they would need to pay for it. Um, that's that's tough. I, I'm actually not sure what the right answer to that is. Um, certainly, I think that some of these strategies would be helpful, but in, in terms of the, the legal advice, or frankly, if you're thinking about just from the financial side of paying back those debts, um, there's no silver bullet. But I would say that you know, anytime you can bring in someone that's a uh, a certified financial planner that will do pro bono work, uh, that will be helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, I would say many of the same strategies would, would apply, even if they don't necessarily have that um, the excess to be able to put away towards it. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you on that. Anything else? Yeah. So um, I noticed that your uh, financial planning sheet talked about monthly income and expenses. Yep. So for a lot of folks that are uh, either very low income and living paycheck to paycheck or now working in a, an economy where jobs are less secure and consistent from week to week, literally, so you make it you know, 40 hours this week, 20 hours next week, a lot of, a lot of times what they experience is mistimed flows, sure. inflows and outflows. And sure. so do you do anything with a finer grain sort of cash flow pers uh, perspective for those kinds of folks? Because you know, they may, during the course of the whole year, make enough money to cover the expenses, but at any given moment, they could be behind on bills because of the, the, the volatility the of their income. Flows, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think one of the things, and, and it's not up here, but certainly um, I'd be happy to discuss about this in more detail, but uh, cash flow planning is a big deal, too, particularly for things like that, but even for <laughs> someone that's got a stable job, you know, timing of bills isn't necessarily something you have complete control of. I mean, right. If you move into a place on the 15th, but you only get paid on the 1st and 15th, like how do you time what the rest of your bills look like when you have to use that one paycheck to pay for, for your rent? But uh, what I would do is, is the best way to do it is to map it out. And, and frankly, you may not know exactly what those look like, but again, to my point about financial planning sort of being outdated the moment it's put on paper, it's that refinement. So, okay, you put together this cash flow plan that says, okay, the first and the fifteenth, these are the, the paychecks I expect, and these are the bills that I expect, and so then you have an idea of what your discretionary cash flow is to do things outside of that. And so I'd say that's a huge component, something that I definitely miss on this front. But yeah, yeah. thanks. I think there's an app that does that. So, so one thing that I was going to mention at the very end is. Uh, there are, there are aggregators that help with these sorts of things. Um, one that I personally use is mint.com. Um, you can pull in all of your debts, all of your, your uh, cash accounts, um, your retirement accounts, and you can get a, a holistic picture of what your current financial situation looks like. It's also really good for budgeting because it sort of already allocates things for you. I know there are a number of them that do that, um, but they were really helpful in the sake of putting together your plan uh, and really that, that whole piece of creating on this budget, too. Are we good? Yeah. Are we good? All right. I will be, as, as Daniel mentioned, I will be just next door. If you guys have any other questions, I'll be here until about 11, and then I'll be back from 1 until the end of your conference. So thank you guys for having me. Uh, great questions, and uh, if there's anything else, please come see me. Thanks. Thank you.